Ruiz. Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfi, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, truth seekers, and truth crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise, and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. Hey, before we get started with today's show, I just want to draw your attention to new merchandise. Funkin' Stuff and Truth and Rhythm designs are in, and they look pretty darn cool. So show your support, help support the program, and show off some stylish merchandise and apparel. Only at the Funkin' Stuff store. I am thrilled to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Command Center, saxophonist for innovative funk originators and extraordinary band regardless of genre, signed the Family Stone's Jerry Martini. He is a founding member of the groundbreaking multiracial, multigender group that released seven albums from 1967 to 1974, with 14 top 30 R&B singles and nine top 40 pop songs. Their stylistic diversity and songcraft range from pounding funk, like Thank You For Letting Me Be Myself Again and Loose Booty, to anthems like Everyday People and Stand, to infectious mid-tempo songs like If You Want Me To Stay and Family Affair, to breezy melodic tracks like Hot Fun in the Summertime. Yet some of the best were deep album tracks like Thank You For Talking To Me Africa and In Time. Martini would go on to play with several other artists including Graham Central Station and Prince, and has continued to perform with other original Family Stone members to keep that hallowed legacy alive. Jerry, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? I'm doing great. Outstanding. Doing great. Okay. Actually, I have right now. Uh, uh, Greg is doing his own thing, and uh, and Sly and Cynthia's daughter, Fun, is my female lead singer. So we got members of the family, and the oldest member of the original band still, and then we got some young clones that did their home. Excellent. Well, I'm so glad that you're still keeping that you know legend alive and keeping that classic unforgettable music alive so keep going at it we're so glad you're doing it i'm gonna bob till i drop <laughs> i'm only 78 <laughs> you're a youngster yeah so uh really glad that we're able to connect uh, we've been talking about this uh, since before the pandemic so great to have you and um you know i wanted to kind of jump in jerry and just ask you something kind of off the wall because i know you've done so many of these interviews over the years and so i thought i would just throw at you 
you know, what's, what's something that people have rarely asked you about the golden era with Sly and the Family Stone? What they rarely ask me? Uh, I don't know, pretty much everybody asks the same thing about time and places, uh, road stories, and um, they never asked me about fights within the, the unit. And so I'll, I'm glad because I don't like to talk about that because it's personal, you know? Sure. Right, right. Well, you know, viewers of this show are diehards. So, I mean, a lot of the viewers are going to have every record, know them front to back, and they're funk and soul and jazz aficionados. So uh, d don't be afraid to go into any any details. Um, um, how, I, I'm sure you've gone over this story before, but uh, maybe it'll bring up some other thoughts. You know, how, how did you first meet Sly and what was your first impression of him? Okay, I was about 18 years old, 19 years old, and and in the East Coast you have Dick Clark show, which we were on several times. And the West Coast we had Dick Stewart's dance party in San Francisco. And Sly was a regular on there. And he was and this once again he broke a lot of racial barriers because back then people were still prejudiced, you know, in, in the early sixties. And uh so I saw him in there, so I was a fan. And then there was a guy named Joe Piazza, had a band called Joe Piazza and the Continentals. And and Sly was the bass player in that band. So I met him uh, on one of the gigs because he used various people. And we hung out. I saw he could sing. He could play the bass. He could play guitar. He could play keyboards. And he was uh, just multi-talented. So we became friends from there, and it just grew until, till now. And did you have a uh, formal sex training, or what was your background before that? Uh, the school of uh, Sonny Stitt, uh, Junior Walker. <laughs> no, I mean I, I I played in school. I played clarinet in the orchestra, which is oddly enough I used on our first hit by accident on dance and the music. That was a little hook thing. I've had people actually want to fight me because they believed that was a soprano sax. It was simply my $110 buffet clarinet that I bought in 1958. <laughs> and it was snowing in New York. And Sly said, the union guy is going to come tonight. You got to bring an instrument or you don't get paid. So I said, well, shoot, I had to walk. So I, I bought my clarinet. And so I'm sitting in the back room when they're going over the, the tracks. And they would go dance to the music. And I would go -da 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 on my clarinet. And so I, all of a sudden he walks by and he goes, get in the studio. And so he used that for the hook um, through that and also through the whole melody, you know, my lady, and so on and so forth. And see, so he, he just had a, a keen ear and he knew what to use and where to use it. Did you even play soprano sax? Yeah. I had a, I had a soprano. I, I used to bring the, I'm a berry sax player. That's why I have a fat sound. And that's also why I have arthritis in my neck and lower back. I used to march with that. They didn't have those straps that fit around your chest. You know, everything went around your neck. So I used to march six miles with that baritone sax, wow. which is the same side of me. I'm a little guy, you know. Wow, that must have been really tough. But maybe that's helped make you stronger for, for today, you know? Well, well no. Uh, it Just because I work out and everything, and I, I go to the gym when we used to have gyms open, uh, but it actually damaged. So I have osteoarthritis in my neck and lower back and a good chiropractor, you know? My, guy, my chiropractor looked at my x-rays, and I go, can you fix it, Doc? And he looked at me and goes, we can manage it. So that was good enough for me. Yeah. Well, I feel you. I've had spine issues myself, so I sympathize. Um, yeah, deal with it and put some biofreeze on there and, uh, and go to work, you know? It's good stuff. Yeah. What, what was it like when you first uh, got together uh, to rehearse with the group, you know? And did you realize that you guys had lightning in a bottle immediately or did it take a little while to gel? Yeah, it's we realized immediately, but mostly what we did the first day was talk. But 
I used to hang out with Slay. You know, like I played on the swim that he wrote for Bobby Freeman. That was his first gold record. He was 19 and I was 20. So we go way back. So anyway, Freddie used to, to, who's also absolutely so talented, he plays more instruments than Sly even. And he ran the rehearsals pretty much. Then when Sly came, we got, we got into a, a serious mode because Sly was absolutely brilliant on putting things together. And Sly just picked up instruments on his own? I mean, did he have any formal musical training? Yeah, he had a he had a teacher. Uh, I forgot, I can't think of his name right now, but he put him on a Mike Douglas show. He really changed Sly's life. It got, gave him the music theory that he needed because Sly uses voicings that nobody else does. We don't sound like a Motown horn section, which is wonderful. I love Motown, but we're not that. We're not stock triad and, and stock uh, arrangement band. He would put he would put the the left shoe on the right foot and he just did things differently and it came out what the hell are you doing because there's only two of us until pat rizzo by the way i'd like to give uh pay homage to pat rizzo my friend of over 50 years who we just lost last week uh oh i hadn't heard that sorry to hear oh, it's all over it's all over facebook but uh I, uh, I found out the day before he passed and then the day, and he was a very close friend for over 50 years. He showed me the real New York. He was, in the, he was driving cab and playing sessions when I met him. Hmm. And um, this a, a marvelous saxophone player and a great addition to the band in 1973, he joined. So I've heard you say, Jerry, that you thought the first album was maybe the best, you know, and the most diverse. Okay. So what was the mindset of you and Sly and the rest of the group when you guys created that? Did you think it was going to go over? Did you care if it went over? Yeah, we did. Uh, I believed in it so hard that I thought it was automatically going to take. Uh, the first album did not see back then you had to have a formula basically all the bands had one hit song and then the rest was hamburger helper and uh that's how the way they did it and so every one of the songs on a whole new thing were a different world and he used different lead singers all the time and they're larry on one uh, rose wasn't in the band until the second album so there was six of us and freddie sang lead larry sang lead and sly sang lead which has never happened since because uh, following the the music business protocol you have to do like what i was saying yeah you see that picture up there there's only six people you know I'm back to look how young we were oh my god <laughs> in the back there that's when when i i used to have my hair combed back you know and uh, <laughs> and that kind of do. And Sly said, you got to put your hair down. You know, he, he made me comb my hair down. I looked like the Beatles at first, and then it grew down, down all the way down my back as the years progressed. So we looked different on that first album, and we grew as the world grew. You know? And with that record, I mean, you just pounded the, the club circuit, right? I mean, you really were just working hard to establish the band. Yeah, well, we went to uh, to Las Vegas when there was only the old Caesar's Palace on the Strip. The Strip, unlike today, which is amazing, there was all clubs. So we played at a place called the Pussycat A Go Go in 1967, and that's where we really got tight. And that's where Bobby Darren and a host of uh, of other famous people would. We were the end place to go after hours. And then on our day off on Mondays, we played from uh, from 12 midnight till 6 in the morning. That was, I guess, the graveyard shift. And then on our day off, we would go to the CBS or Sunset and Gower. Where there was only two track back then. We recorded the first album on a two track. There was no overdubbing. If we, somebody made a mistake, we had to hold, do the whole damn thing over again. So we got tight. <laughs> Out of necessity, yeah. Um, was there anyone on the road that you guys encountered 
at that time that really influenced or, or inspired the group? No. Sly was the inspiration. But he loved Ray Charles. He loved James Brown. He loved all the people that were doing it, and uh, and they loved him too. Miles Davis used to be on the road with us sometimes. You know, he's a he's a hard guy to get along with. You know. <laughs> Did you have uh, much interactions with with Miles? Yeah, what's that? Did you have much interaction with Miles Davis? I did sometimes. Uh, we were playing in Central Park for like 100,000 people. And he was there. He had on a beautiful, really expensive suit, patent leather shoes and no socks, I remember. And we sat and talked for about an hour or two back. Say he, he never, uh, I would see him at, at Trancus in, in Malibu afterwards and stuff. Like, hi, Miles. He would just look at me like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> yeah. But I understood him. And I, res I respected his talent. And his, uh, I don't give a shit personality. He was Miles all the way. Yeah. Herbie Hancock, Herbie Hancock played on one of the albums too. He loved Sly too. Hmm. Who didn't? I mean, he was such a, a creative force um, and so multi talented. Absolutely. I, I know that he, you know, Intent with intent put the group together to have a certain look and certain sound, but how much into the minutia did, did Sly get in terms of you know uh, costumes and and presentation and all that? Well, in the beginning, you can see we were wearing what we could because we're all poor, and as we as we started to make it, and he made everybody to have a look, a special look. Sly, of course getting a lot of money once we get going. He had nudie. He had the best people in, in Hollywood make his costumes. And, and we, we just made do. We just went and got something that he liked. If he didn't like, he didn't like, it was really funny. One of the albums where we're, he's got his hand out and we're walking up and we're a little tiny. He didn't like what I wore. So he looked around, he saw a cow skin rug on the floor. And he said, anybody got a razor? He cut a hole in it and threw it at me and said, that's your outfit, man. And it, people went wild over it. It was horrible to play it because it was so sweaty, but it's not one of the album covers. It was iconic. His idea is he wanted us to have our own look. He didn't want me to look like uh, uh, like Broadway in San Francisco, you know? He, was, well, he didn't want us to look like nightclub dudes or ladies. It was totally innovative. He was ahead of his time. And uh, he had to go through a lot of mental suffering with, uh, with the media, the, the record companies. They, uh, they wanted us to do, uh, we could get one hit song and all the rest of them be Hamburger Helper. That's so everybody did before. He was talking to one guy who had a big hit. He goes, yeah, I'm writing another one. You know, he goes, they should all be hits. You should think of every song as a hit. And that's what he did. And that's why he was so different. He had so many songs in his head that he had hundreds, literally hundreds of songs. You probably never hear them. I think he lost his songbook uh, during the, uh, the the wild days. But he still, you can buy about six albums of his stuff. And a lot of them never heard before. Wow. So... Can you put into words, Jerry, what it was like to be, you know, intimate and so close to that sort of creative force? I was in awe. I went over, when we were working down on Broadway, when he had playing with, he had a group called Sly and the Mojo, man. And I was playing with George and Teddy in the Condor, at the Condor Club in San Francisco. They just did a movie. I'm going to be in that movie. And... Uh, he liked us because we were the first innovative uh, uh, mixed club band that was playing. We uh, we had an album out that, that was terrible. It was on Warner Brothers because they couldn't write. It was a talented band. In fact, Sly produced them later on. They they didn't talk to me for a couple of years because we work in the clubs. Finally, we had a thousand dollar a week each job at Caesar's Palace. That was a lot of money then. And I turned it down and make 10 bucks a night with Sly. So, so Teddy, who was my friend, he, 
you didn't talk to me for a long time, you know. And then we became best friends again. We were really close all the way until he passed away. So was there a democratic aspect to the family stone with Sly, though? I mean, how much input did the other band members get to contribute? Uh, everybody had their two cents, and he weighed it all. He used it. I mean, we, Sly and I, in the old days, before limos and that, we had a beat up old truck, and him and I would, would go in the, the the equipment truck, and we brought the B three organ, and and Big Daddy would be behind us in a big ten passenger station wagon, and uh, he used to carry it because he's the only one Sly trusted with the money, so uh, he used to carry this big old giant flashlight <laughs> with him, and he was a good friend. He was my roommate for a few years, and. I learned a lot from him. He was a wise man. But it was different. We was on the road the hard way. That's why Rose didn't come along. At first, when we first started playing, she said, I got a good job. She said, I ain't going to come until it's safe. And we laugh about that because that's how she is. And uh, then when she joined on, on our first hit and our our second album, she became a, a regular member and an incredible uh, addition to the band. That's not the first. She's not in that one. Not in that one. Nope. Lisa has Dance to the Music. I was wondering, is that Dance to the Music? Yeah, yeah. Rose is in that. Yeah. She's in that one, yeah. Yeah. That's the first one that all seven members. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Jerry, when, when Dance to the Music, first of all, when you're in the studio and Dance to the Music is created, how confident did everybody feel that that was going to be a hit? We loved it. It was a whole new thing. Instead of being doing stuff that more of the jazz people liked than the in certain pop groups, like we loved the Vanilla Fudge and they loved us, you know. And when Sly was a DJ, that before uh, I helped talk him out of stopping that and, and starting the band, uh, he broke uh, the Vanilla Fudge and his soul station. Which see, he was innovative in so many ways. He crossed the line with white and black music. And you don't play white people on this. Sly did. He loved the Beatles. He loved Bob Dylan. He loved Vanilla Fudge. He was not like, I'm only going to be black. He was everything. And it's like he used to tell me, hey, man, it's just the skin I'm in. And wiser words were never said. Yeah. When you first heard Dance to the Music on the radio, do you remember that experience? Uh, were you just super excited? Yeah, I was like, I was, I just freaked out because the, the thing how it started out, that boom, 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 that wasn't in the original record. They added that in the mix and they put it in the front of the album last minute before it was just in the middle. And that really was one of the hooks that sold the song, you know? And so then when that hit, you guys are instantly doing larger venues and getting TV appearances and things like that? Yeah, we, uh, in 68, we played it on Ed Sullivan's show, which was, I remember, I couldn't move my legs. I, I've never been stage shy. But in that, I said, somebody nailed my feet to the stage. <laughs> <laughs> and then once we got going, I, I loosened up a little bit, but. That was amazing. And and then it even freaked us out more because Ed Sullivan couldn't see what shit. And he, he was the biggest thing to be on. And he goes, he was looking at the call thing. He goes, and now we have the hardest new comedy acts, Slaw in a Family Stone. <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh, shit. Well, they cut that out, you know, of the, uh, the, but it was live. So everybody heard that. And so also, Sly was the first person that I know of that backstage changed our arrangement, our arrangements, cut them down, only one verse here, one verse there, so we can get it all in live. Because you couldn't play the tracks then. You had to play live. So he was innovative, quickly innovative. You know, he was so sharp and so on then, you know. You know, things didn't start to fall apart until later. Then after you make it and all the dogs and the snakes and all the people come in to uh, to try to 
get involved in your life by bribing you with the worst things in the world that you could possibly have, you know? That's life. Which which instrument do you think he was strongest on? Was it the keyboard? No. Billy Preston taught him how to do a lot of stuff on the keyboards. Now, he's a, uh, Sly was a bass player and also a guitar player, a good guitar player. But when I met him, we used to play with Joe Pierce and the Continentals. And, and he was in the Viscaines, too. And I remember I remember the Viscaines well. And uh, we used to be the backup band for them, too, for when, when they we played the Viscaines. I'm still in, in, in contact with, uh, with Charlene and... Uh, and some of the other guys. Yeah, I've seen they, they, they not too long ago re-released some of that Viscaine's material, so it's out there. And, uh, yeah, our friends, uh, uh, the twins from uh, from Denmark, and put it out. I was the first person that they knew. They came, at, they came to my house, you know, and when they were 18 years old, and I brought them around, I introduced them to everybody. And then they did their homework. Now they're very rich, you know. They're very rich because they're smart. Now they have families. They were both 18 years old when they first came to America. So after that, Stand came. And Stand is, is just, you know, you talk, what a great title because it stood the test of time and will always stand the test of time. Just Listen, yeah. <laughs> like, a, like a, oh yeah. It's like a greatest hits record. You know, I mean, it's just so strong from top to bottom. How much yeah. how much work went into that? I mean, did it did did the songs and the material just flow, or, or was it painstaking? Sly, so this is at the point to where pretty much Sly told everybody what to play. He wrote the lyrics. He was the he was the king. He knew exactly what he wanted, what he was doing, and we used to that used to be at all the colleges. That was the theme song for most colleges when. We played stand. All the college students stood up and lit whatever they had back then. Bics, matches, I don't know, hand grenades, I think, whatever they had. And it became the, yeah, that's the one. See, I had a Beatle haircut then. <laughs> that that's right. A little Ringo Starish, yeah, or George Harrison. Yeah. But then that's because her hair was combed back like this. And then Sly so came up to me and got, got a brush and he combed my hair down. Just like the, like the rug. And did you see the the album that had me wearing a rug? And we're all in his hand. Um, which, no. one, which one is that? I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I remember that picture. Was it on the Greatest Hits record? I'm not sure. Look up my, I have them all up on my wall behind me here. But I don't have the Greatest Hits record here. It might have been on that one. I think it was on that one. So, um, yeah. yeah um, so when that record came out, I mean, you guys were just, you were as big as it gets at that point. Yeah, we were. Actually, we were. It was a highlight of my life there. Uh, that was in the late 60s. After Woodstock, it really took off, you know. We went from playing the casinos to playing the arenas, you know. And that fiasco in 1969, where they blamed us for the Chicago riots, was bullshit. And I'm going to use the word bullshit. We tried to get to that, and Mayor Daley did not want us to be there. So they told us a different time, and they announced us a different time. We drove all night to get there. And we even offered to fly or pay for a helicopter to come in, but said, no, it's okay. And writing was happening. And from then on, we had to pay a huge bonus, like $50,000 uh, front money to play anywhere. It absolutely ruined our careers for uh, practically, you know. And we weren't guilty. We were guilty. My slide was guilty at a lot of other ones where he just uh, somehow he didn't make it, you know. But he, uh, that one, we were on it. And we were there to play, and we got the entire blame. People still, I talk to people now, so why would you guys have to ruin that concert? They go, it's 50 years later, people are still pissed at me. Wow. <laughs> Man. In 69, besides Woodstock also, uh, there's that movie coming out uh, soon called Summer of Soul. 
which yeah. is the uh, Harlem Cultural uh, Event? Yeah, remember that gig. It was outdoors. It was hot as hell. Gregor Rico was sick, sick as a dog, and he played anyway. He, uh, you know, he was sick a few times, but God bless him. He got up and he played, you know. In Canada, <laughs> one gig, he was so sick, he was like falling off the drum stoop, but he still played. Wow. So that, that we we're all like that, though. We play unless you didn't have to, like, drag us away with with a pit bull or something before we would not play. So were you aware that there was footage of that show and that it, you know, it hasn't been seen in 50 years, I guess? Nope. I just remember it very well. I remember it. It was in Harlem. It was outdoors. And we got off to a slow start because we, so I was playing a lot of stuff they never heard. You know, then when we start to get into the funky stuff, then they hit it and boy, they loved us. We used to we used to play at uh, in, in Harlem every year at the what the hell is the name of it Apollo yeah at the Apollo every year the first time I walked on stage at Apollo see they didn't know the West Coast wasn't in contact with the East Coast back then they had different charts and everything and we're walking out one at a time as we did when I walked out everybody started booing. So they had my long hair and stuff, and they looked at me, boo, boo, and Sly, I said, I was just freaked out. And Sly stopped everything and goes, wait a minute. He goes, you don't have to be any color to be in this band. You just have to know how to play. Jerry, play. Oh, shit. So I just closed my eyes and started playing some blues, and the one lady out in the audience said, send that boy out here. <laughs> and and the guys were laughing. He said, one, two, three, four. And we got into it. And from then on, every time we played at the Apollo, I got a special welcome from all the people in the audience. I love them, and they love me. And still like that. Yeah. I, played, I played a few years ago. I played in Detroit with my family stone band. And it was like a bad area of town. There's a lot of older people there. There was thousands. I said, oh, shit, what's going to happen now? I got the warmest welcome. People were coming up, people in their 50s and 60s. They would come up to me and they were hugging me because we had to drive in one of those golf cart things, the big one, to go to sign autographs. And they were coming up and they were the warmest, most wonderful audience you'll ever want to see. That's when it's just so wonderful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, good. I, I've been made to feel so. We just did uh, the Soul Train cruise right before the pandemic, right before it. And once again, they absolutely loved us. All the most of the bands were African American, and they all came to our gig. And they absolutely loved the band, and I couldn't be ha more happy. And also, we played the Flower Power Cruise, which is predominant, predominantly Caucasian, but it's mixed, and it's the same with them. We're one of the first bands that would be on both charts. We'd start off on the soul chart for about three or four months, then we'd go on the pop chart for about however long. When, when did the audience start to shift the most, you know, in the gen genesis of the band or the progression of the group, you know, as Dance to the Music and Stan came out? How did the audience uh, demographics change? Well, because it was accepted, uh, radio ruled that we, they were playing us on the soul charts and the pop charts. And then consequently, we got both of them to our audience. We brought people together. We didn't do it on purpose. We didn't call and say, look, we want to mix some people up, you know. It just happened that we got mixed up. We played at Cobo Hall when it was all black. And it was by at least 20, 30% Caucasian we played there. And nobody fought that we saw. They might have got their ass kicked outside. But, <laughs> but in the concert, they were all good. And he had the power in those days to start a riot or stop a riot, you know. And he had that kind of power. When, when you do too much of something, there's a thing that we call your, your higher power, you know, and when you block that, you lose that power. And that's what happened. Cause he had it. He had the power. Is there any particular performance that stands out in your mind where maybe you were just kind of looking over at Sly and just in awe that he really on a particular show just dug really deep and it was just like the heavens opening up or something Lots of them. The, the the time that we see in the old in, in the old days uh the 
they have security guards, but they're there to enforce the law, you know, which means they want to kick some ass. And uh, people come on up there, you can't do that, <laughs> you know. But what he did, he stopped a concert at Mad Square Garden before, and he goes, look, I'm not sure if it was Mad Square Garden. It was another big one like that. He said, listen, officers, we appreciate your help, but let me talk to them because they were rushing the stage. We'll see if they can take it, handle it. So he talked to the audience like this, and he kind of like appointed a role monitor, so to speak. You know, can you guys handle this yourself, or are you going to have them come up and bash your head? Could we do this ourselves? Yeah, and people were screaming, yeah. And the cops at that particular year, they sat down, they were all pissed, you know, because they wanted to be the, in control, you know. But later, he got to the cops. At Madison Square Garden, uh, at one time, all the police were dancing. They're all dancing with the crowd. You don't see that, you know? And now it's, it's really crazy. But I wish we were young now and we're just doing that. We could help bring the people together more than they are. Because right now it's, it's A or B, you know? It's black or white or Latino or Asian. We, that wasn't that way with us. It was Sly always used to tell me, I, you know, I said, uh, there's a whole lot of taxpayers here in town that probably kick my ass. He goes, but you're the one I wanted. I said, okay. So, and he, we used to sit and talk for hours after our gigs at down on Broadway. And he said, you know, it's just the skin I'm in, man. Just the skin I'm in. Ain't hey, nothing, you close your eyes and, and that's what it is. He was way, way ahead of his time. Absolutely. So far, he couldn't handle it himself, you know. Well, you talk about ahead of his time, you know, being the age that I am, I first got into him and became aware of him, you know, after the peak and the heyday uh, was more like mid-70s. So yeah. when, I, when I first heard Sing a Simple Song, I was just like, wait, this is how old? I'm like, I couldn't believe that that song was that many years previous because it still sounded so fresh. Yes, you know, and uh, it was just amazing. And then just discovering it all was just so amazing. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends and become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.